Um, I want to thank uh, Professor Sean Burgess and all the good people that have uh, made this uh, event possible and that invited me here. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, June 22nd of 2012 will be remembered as a very singular day in Paraguayan history and one that uh, marked a sense of controversy in many countries in the region. Uh, you see, that was the day that uh, Paraguay's uh, uh, elected president, the former bishop, uh, Fernando Lugo, was uh, ousted by uh, uh, a very controversial impeachment process. Um, I can't go into all the details of this, but I could maybe follow up in the questions. Uh, just enough to suggest that um, I have a pretty clear opinion of what happened. Uh, uh, there's no doubt that the opposition uh, uh, um, picked on certain clauses in the Constitution that allowed them to do uh, what could be interpreted as a very speedy impeachment process. Uh, and they used a very ambiguous clause in the impeachment uh, uh, um, articles of the Constitution that allowed for the uh, ouster of uh, any president for a poor performance on the job, which means it was a very vague wording in the Constitution that enabled them to do this. Uh, of course, these, uh, uh, so there's an interpretation that says that this was done according to constitutional law, and uh, Tompi, Fernando Lugo, and his, and, 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 uh, and his mates, political mates. Uh, there's another interpretation, of course, that says that, uh, uh, um, uh, that this was not legal, uh, that the Constitution in Paraguay enshrines due process, that uh, the whole pr uh, notion of due process was trampled over the fact that this was conducted over in 24 hours. President Lugo was given an evening to prepare for his defense, and his lawyers or, or spokespersons in the Congress had only two hours to present their arguments. Uh, uh, and so it was almost like um, a, 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 a very decorous and liberal lynching mob, uh, a, a mob that ousted the president. Uh, other crucial elements of the spirit of democracy were trampled. Uh, the fact that uh, President Lugo in a presidential re regime was elected with a, a significant vote of the people. And uh, uh, my sense is that no, no proper consideration was given for the popular sovereignty that had put them in power. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, there was no clear sense of democratic deliberation. At, at place. Uh, the arguments uh, calling for his impeachment uh, were not sustained with any proof or evidence, and no serious effort was made to uh, uh, marshal, marshal such uh, kind of support. Um, and uh, on the night before the impeachment, uh, a high strung delegation of UNASUR appeared in Paraguay. Uh, uh, it was led by the foreign minister of Brazil, Antonio Patriota, uh, and perhaps uh, accom accompanied even by greater swagger by Venezuela's uh, foreign minister, Nicolas Maduro, and other high-flying members uh, of, uh, of the foreign policy establishment of UNASUL countries. Uh, they talked to the Senate, uh, uh, they uh, pleaded and said, you know, you should do this properly. If you vote tomorrow, it's not going to be recognized as a valid impeachment process. Uh, but the senators, uh, uh, many of them who were wondering who Antonio Patriota is, meaning they were not very even informed about geopolitical issues around, uh, decided to vote for a swift impeachment the following day. It was a 39 to 4 uh, 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 vote, and uh, uh, Lugo grudgingly uh, um, uh, accepted the vote, but uh, decried its impact in terms of a democracy in Paraguay, which was basically the line uh, that Itamarati and the other Mercosul members uh, uh, adopted straight after that, where they basically decided that Paraguay would be suspended from uh, Mercosul as a result of this. And unanimously, uh, uh, all the presidents of, uh, uh, of UNASUL, the South American Union, also decided to uh, suspend Paraguay on account of, uh, of this very brash proceeding that, for lack of a better word, because it was a very unusual you know, uh, uh, coup d'etat, right? There was clearly not, no militaries in the street. It was a very liberal affair. Constitutional guarantees were still kept. Lugo was out there preaching that he was ousted illegally, and so are his uh, uh, supporters. Uh, uh, nobody has really been imprisoned, uh, uh, tortured, or barred like in any traditional coup d'etat. So one could almost describe it as a liberal coup, or one could probably coin the term as well, colpeachment, as some people have done. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, this reaction on the part of the Brazilian uh, chancellery uh, uh, was not uh, uh, entirely new. Uh, 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 starting in the 1990s, particularly with President Fernando Henrique Cardoso, Brazil had intervened twice to make sure that the democratization process in Paraguay would not be derailed. Once with the uh, attempted coup d'etat by General Lino Cesar Oviedo in April 1996, 
and secondly with a serious regime crisis that unfolded in March 1999 with the assassination of the Vice President of Paraguay, uh, uh, Fernando Enrique Cardoso took an active role, called the then President uh, uh, um, Cuba's Grau and basically said, we'll offer you a plane to come to Brazil, relinquish power. And, uh, and I would argue that in both circumstances, Brazil's position uh, and that of the international community that worked with Brazil, primarily the United States government, was very supportive of the democratic process. Uh, this pro-democracy shift in Brazil's foreign policy establishment is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, under uh, Brazil's military regime, relations with General Alfredo Stroessner were particularly warm. Um, as recently as 1988, in 1993, when Brazil was already a democracy, uh, the Itamaraty had nothing to say about serious instances of electoral fraud in Paraguay. Hence, this uh, pro-democracy shift that took place under the Cardoso administration had, and has been maintained under the Lula and Dilma uh, 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 governments uh, has had, I would argue, an important role in shoring up the democratic uh, process and prospects in Paraguay, a position that I would argue should be valued and commended. Uh, the Brazilian government, however, failed in uh, this particular uh, instance of golpeachment uh, uh, to uh, prevent Lugo's ouster, and this underscores a point that other scholars have made that uh, uh, you know Itamaraty can have the best polished diplomats and, and have a lot of swagger and sway in politics in Latin America, but they cannot uh, always uh, get their way even with smaller and weaker countries like Paraguay. Uh, this uh, uh, approach to un explaining Brazil's engagements with Paraguay um, has a, a problem, however. Uh, uh, by underscoring this kind of commitment to Paraguay's democratization process, very often uh, 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 one is obscuring other issues that are not so uh, uh, beneficial for Paraguay and that very much relate to the way Brazil and Paraguay uh, uh, interact. Uttered by uh, foreign policy elites in Brazil, uh, it often comes off as a sort of self-congratulatory statement, one that tends to reinforce paternal paternalistic attitudes towards Paraguay, even among left-leaning diplomats and intellectuals. Moreover, uh, this sort of view of uh, Brazil's relations with Paraguay tends to ignore, downplay, and omit some very important and rather inconvenient truths about Para Paraguay and Brazilian relations. This alternative perspective that I would like to add to this narrative that I've just offered um, is one that is very much affected by the fact that I was raised in Paraguay. I know the country well. I love the country. My family is there. And, uh, uh, but I've also lived in Brazil. I lived for more than five years on and off, and I know Brazil well. So I could be, I'm probably the only uh, uh, Brazilianista Paraguayo that exists out there that can understand both worlds quite well. Um, and so uh, 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 the things that I'm going to say, I think, are uh, my attempts to uh, uh, do something that uh, uh, many Paraguayans would sometimes want to do with Brazilian audiences or, or Brazilian-minded audiences, which is to speak truth to power. Uh, Brazil is our big, powerful neighbor. And the things that I want to say are no sign of disrespect for the Itamaraty. I think that uh, I have great French friends that are diplomats, and I have a lot of respect for them. But there are some things about uh, Brazilian-Paraguayan relations that need to be said in an honest, clear, and forceful language, and I will attempt to do so right now. Uh, and, and, and in this regard, I will uh, underscore five issues uh, or themes that highlight the importance of analyzing the broader structural developments and effects that shape, frame, and influence uh, 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 Brazil's relations with Paraguay. Viewed together, these uh, bring a series of themes that add layers of complexity and nuance to the study of, uh, of Paraguayan-Brazilian relations. First issue that I want to raise is the sizable economic presence of Brazilian firms in Paraguay and the important trade volume between both countries. Uh, Back in 1965, when they inaugurated the, the now famous bridge, Puente de la Amistad, between uh, 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 Brazil, uh, Paraguay, Eastern Paraguay, and Brazil, um, the uh, uh, trade volume between both countries, uh, uh, overall trade volume, was at 0.2%. Uh, uh, back in those days, Paraguay's over major trade, trading partner was Argentina. And Argentina had always had a, a much greater clout over Paraguayan politics, society, and, and, and economics. Uh, at that point, trade with Argentina was at 23% uh, 
Um, uh, by, 19, the, by the 1970s, uh, uh, things, our Brazil began to catch up. And in 1978, for the first time, uh, uh, trade relations with, uh, uh, with uh, Brazil had topped those that Paraguay had historically had with Argentina. Uh, by 1990, Brazil trade with Paraguay more than doubled uh, 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 that of Argentina from uh, 23 to 10 percent. Um, I have sort of a, a, a personal metaphor to explain this process because uh, uh, I grew up in Paraguay during this time and uh, in the early 70s we always had uh, uh, cocoa milk uh, for breakfast at our breakfast table and the, and the brand that we always had was Todi. It was an Argentine brand, right? By the mid 70s I noticed that we no longer had Todi on our table, it was Nescau and it was a Brazilian brand. And uh, you could talk about a whole series of products in the supermarkets and stores, and you could clearly see the, 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 the shift in trading uh, pattern at that point. Um, uh, adding to this, uh, 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 there has been a, a growing and significant impact of Brazilian firms in Paraguay. Brazilian banks and Brazilian-owned banks operating in Paraguay control a large portion of the country's banking se sector. Uh, the nation's flagship airline, TAM, which has near monopoly of flights to Asuncion, is also Brazilian-owned. In recent years, Petrobras has scaled up substantially its presence in Paraguay. It now furnishes 38% of gasoline distributed in this country, and after buying up Shell, it has become the largest gasoline distributor in this country. Brazilian interests have had a huge impact also on, on Paraguay's agribusiness development, and I will speak more about that soon. Uh, a second issue to consider is the large presence of Brazilian nationals on Paraguay's border with this country. The inauguration of this, this Puente de la Amistad, uh, um, uh, uh, really, and the opening up of Paraguay's eastern frontier, uh, really attracted large numbers of Brazilian farmers eager to access land, uh, mostly virgin tropical forests at that time, uh, 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 which were, and, and these lands were much, uh, much cheaper than the prices in, that they were paying in southern Brazil. This immigration was abetted by General Stroessner's uh, regime uh, uh, policy that cherished the idea of introducing modern farmers of European stock, mostly of German and Italian descent, to jumpstart Paraguay's soybean economy. Uh, and this was abetted further by the context of the construction of the Itaipu Dam and the ratification of a treaty of extensive cooperation between Brazil and Paraguay in 1975. The population of Brazilian nationals swelled in the 1970s and 80s, particularly in the uh, frontier states of Alto Paraná and Canendiju, and in doing so created uh, towns in which the dominant language was Portuguese and the dominant currency was the Brazilian currency. Uh, many Brazilian immigrants uh, were quite poor, others were mid-sized farmers uh, uh, in southern Brazil looking for an opportunity to expand. A few, though, became fabulously wealthy and are among the country's most powerful agribusiness entrepreneurs. Uh, there are no clear numbers uh, as to the uh, number of uh, uh, volume of uh, uh, Brazilians living in Paraguay. The lower estimates put this figure at about 350,000, the higher ones at about half a million. Uh, their economic, uh, uh, cultural, and even political dominance in many parts of Paraguay's eastern frontier is striking. In Alto Paraná, 55% of all rural properties over 1,000 hectares are owned by Brazilian nationals. In Canandiju, the this number jumps to 60%. In recent years, Brazilians have been buying up massive am amounts of land in the northern Chaco region of Paraguay, of Alto Paraguay. Um, no country that I'm aware of have the citizens of a dominant regional power uh, have uh, exercised as much influence on the frontier region of a neighboring country as in the case of Brazil and Paraguay. Many Paraguayans view this as an affront to their national sovereignty, and I suspect that a large number of Brazilians would uh, feel the same if the situation was applied to their country. Uh, in fact, Brazil and Ar uh, Argentina and many other countries have very strict rules forbidding foreign nationals, particularly those from neighboring countries, to purchase land within a certain radius, usually 50 or 100 uh, uh, kilometers of their national border. This is something that successive uh, governments uh, in Paraguay have been remiss to enforce in no small part due to the huge political cost of affecting relevant laws. Third uh, 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 structural point, the role of Brazilian agribusiness interests and in affecting Paraguay's model of rural development. Brazilians are largely responsible for initiating Paraguay's agribusiness-oriented agribusiness, uh, uh, model of rural development. 
Soybeans are at the heart of this. Uh, uh, there was a, a rapid growth of so soybean plantations in the 1990s and 2000s, and, which led Paraguay to become the fourth largest producer of soybeans in the world. Uh, uh, Brasiguayos, the Brazilians settled in Paraguay, are responsible for 90% of this production. Close to half of, uh, of the main agribusiness firms uh, uh, settled in Paraguay are own, owned by Brazilians. And some of these firms are uh, run by the largest landholders in the country. One Brazilian entrepreneur alone, Tanquilo Favero, uh, uh, is known as the country's soybean king, is reputed to own one million hectares of land in Paraguay. Uh, Brazilians overall control at least 13% of Paraguay's national territory and 20% of its arable land. Uh, these are huge proportions to any other country that one can compare to in Latin America. Many estates owned by Brazilian farmers have been the subject of, uh, of intense legal uh, controversy and social disputes by landless peasants. Why? Because a third of Paraguay's territory was doled out illegally during the Stroessner regime and the subsequent Colorado Party led transition to democracy. We're talking about a territory the size of Cuba, and this has been the source of huge uh, 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 ongoing uh, legal and social controversies in Paraguay. A fourth issue is uh, the impact of Brazilian criminal groups, Brazilian demand for illicit good, goods, uh, 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 and the impact of all this on Paraguay's uh, uh, Burgoyne uh, mafiosi political economy. Uh, there's often the image that I've encountered in Brazil when I tell Brazilians that I'm from Paraguay and the people from the, the, you know, the common folk will say, ah, they look at me and they say, você do Paraguay, lá é tudo barato, you know, you're from Paraguay, everything is really cheap there because they have memories of having gone on some shopping spree in Paraguay, on Paraguay uh, border towns. Uh, 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 if you read press depictions and you often talk to middle class and upper class people, you will often see a, a sense of prejudice towards Paraguay. Paraguay is a country of bandits, of false falsifiers and, and many corrupt people, right? There's a kernel of truth in this uh, uh, and, and all these elements, uh, uh, no doubt. But, uh, 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 but most of, uh, and in fact, most of the narcotics that supply Brazil, uh, uh, Brazilian growing, Brazil's growing appetite for illicit stimulants actually comes from Paraguay. Brazilian federal police estimates that 70% of the marijuana consumed in Brazil is grown in Paraguay. And among consumers of marijuana, par Paraguayan marijuana ranks very high. Uh, I have, I don't know from personal experience, but a lot of people that I know will tell you that. Uh, uh, if you also look at the statistics on cocaine, 60% of the cocaine that reaches Brazil is transshipped through uh, this country. In addition, 55% of the illegal weapons used uh, to arm criminal gangs in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo pass through Paraguay. Paraguay is also the destination for a profitable market uh, of stolen cell phones and vehicles. In 1999, this was emblemized by a scandal that involved then-President uh, Luis uh, uh, González uh, Maki, uh, uh, who was, uh, uh, who was uh, discovered to have had a stolen uh, uh, BMW from, uh, uh, from Sao Paulo, right? And around this time, uh, it was estimated that more than half of the cars circulating in Brazil had been stolen in Brazil. Uh, Brazilians often like to point fingers amid such scandals and assume that Paraguayans are the sole culprits of such rotten behavior. But I think there should be a little more humility in all this. Uh, and Brazilians should also recognize their involvement and complicity in many of these criminal acts. After all, the car was stolen in Sao Paulo uh, 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 in this particular case. Brazil has been, for many years, and to the detriment of Paraguay, a staging ground for Brazilian criminal groups. It is well known that the Primeiro Comando da Capital, PCC, has a, a, a major enterprises operating out of Paraguay, that uh, uh, famous drug pins like Fernandinho Beiramar and other uh, uh, notorious drug leaders, uh, Brazilian drug leaders, have used Paraguay as a basis for their illicit operations. Uh, this mafiosi component of Paraguay's political economy is closely linked all, as well to the triangular commercial activities in its uh, uh, Brazilian fr frontier, notably in, uh, uh, in relation to Ciudad del Este. Uh, the size of the triangular commerce is impressive. Uh, in 2007 alone, contraband and unregistered shopping tourism accounted for $3.5 billion, roughly 30% of Paraguay's official GDP. In the 1990s, the country gained a solid reputation as a safe heaven for laundering hot money uh, uh, related to the international drug trafficking and unrecognized contraband, much of this stemming and related to uh, uh, dealings with Brazil. According to the U.S. State Department in 2000, about $4 billion were being laundered through Paraguay to the U.S. 
Paraguay was laundering more uh, 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 hot monies than either uh, Brazil or Argentina at that point. Uh, uh, and this uh, was a sum that was close to five times the reg total registered exports in Paraguay. And the fifth point, uh, and it's, it's a, it's a delig delicate one, but it has to be said, uh, is, 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 is looking at the structural effects of Brazil's expropriation of Paraguay's uh, energy resources uh, through the uh, by, uh, Itaipu Binational Dam. The 1990, uh, 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 1966 treaty signed between Brazil and Paraguay agreed that a major hydroelectric dam will be built on the Paraná River that both, both countries share and that Paraguay would be paid a fair price for the energy sold to Brazil. The 1973 treaty, however, that, uh, that established the creation of the Itaipu Dam and was signed by two dictators, General Alfredo Stroessner and General Medici, uh, uh, led to the construction of the world's largest hydroelectric dam, uh, uh, which uh, uh, the Itaipu Dam, which supplies 19% of all the uh, hydroelectric uh, uh, power that is consumed by Brazil. Because of alterations in the 1973 treaty, Paraguay has been obliged to sell all of its surplus energy, close to a 95% of its share, at a fixed low price, roughly on par with the cost of production. The disproportion with the price it would obtain by selling the surplus energy at market price is staggering. In 2010, this involved an 8 to 1 differential. Experts argue uh, uh, that if paid a fair market price for the energy sold to Paraguay, Paraguay could augment its GDP in that year alone uh, by close to $3.5 billion. That is roughly 20% of Paraguay's GDP. In 2009, Brazil and Paraguay signed an agreement that tripled Paraguay's compensation for the energy sold to Brazil from $100 to $300 million. Though a step in the right direction, it falls, short, uh, it falls way short of the financial resources that Paraguay could reap from receiving a, a market-based price or being allowed to sell the surplus energy to willing buyers in Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile. Because of this deeply unjust treaty, Paraguay's GDP is at least three times smaller today than it could have been with an agreement that paid Paraguay a fair market share price over the last 20 years. As a result, Paraguay has had to forfeit major social and development benefits and all the multiplier effects that could have been obtained from this important natural asset. All of these elements uh, uh, of analysis suggest that Paraguay's dependence on Brazil is a fundamentally uh, a structural rather than a political one, although the impact of all this on Paraguayan politics and society could hardly be underestimated. Uh, wrapping up, uh, uh, if we look at the consequences of these structural developments and effects on Paraguay, we could see that most of them are by far <coughs> negative and some of them terribly nefarious for the prospects of democracy in Paraguay or for the prospects of enhancing the quality of democracy in Paraguay. Paraguay today is a much poorer nation than it could be had it uh, because of the unfair terms of the Itaipu Treaty. And as we know, poorer nations have a more difficult prospects for democracy and they have more difficult prospects for having a better qualitative democracy. Uh, uh, the, uh, the agribusiness model of development that, uh, uh, that Brazilians have pursued in Paraguay, on the other hand, has generated significant wealth. Wealth uh, in 2011, uh, 2010, uh, Paraguay's GDP grew by 15% on account uh, uh, largely of the boom in favorable prices for its soybean exports. But the particular nature of this kind of wealth generation needs to be considered here. Large scale agribusiness model of development is one that fundamentally concent concentrates wealth and generates relatively few jobs. Uh, uh, and this is part and parcel of the fact that uh, Paraguay today is one of the most unequal societies in the world in terms of its land tenure system. Only 2% of the population controls 85% of all the arable uh, 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 land in Paraguay. Uh, and when we look at the prospects for job creation, every uh, uh, large scale agribusiness farm generates about one job for every 300 hectares. A family farm would generate one job for every five hectares. And so there's a, a, a huge loss of job opportunities generated with the expansion of this agribusiness model of, of development in Paraguay, along with tremendous uh, environmental costs uh, due to the widespread use of pesticides and, and the controversial debate over the role of GMOs and all this, and, and, and a very high social cost uh, uh, because of the uh, land conflicts that, are, that ensue and, and the protests over intense fumigation over peasant communities that have been, in many, in many parts of Brazil, driven off their lands because of the fumigation and, and, and pressure from these agribusiness enterprises. So all of this uh, uh, plays into the fact that uh, Paraguay has a uh, structure 
of, uh, of uh, uh, society uh, that is basically uh, um, very hostile to the prospects of democracy. It ranks among the most unequal societies in the world. And uh, 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 in the last uh, reading that I did of the UNDP figures, it was number 13th on par with Brazil and South Africa. Uh, and it has a third of its population living in poverty and 60% of these people in extreme poverty. Uh, and this combination is just bad, bad energy, bad juju energy, we could say, for the prospects of democracy in Paraguay. And Brazil has been a contributor, much more than a, a, a detractor for this kind of, these kinds of problems. So all of this suggests that, uh, that Brazil, Paraguay, and I wrap, wrap things up here, uh, uh, looking at Paraguay-Brazil relations through this more complex, complex and nuanced lens, one that looks at structural elements uh, 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 of their interaction, uh, uh, reveals a side of Brazil that Brazilians would not be very proud of. It's a, it reveals a sort of the darker underbelly uh, 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 of Brazil's attempt to become a potencia uh, in the world, uh, Brazil's attempt to develop its autoestima on a global stage, right? Uh, uh, and so um, I, th I think that all of this is, uh, um, teaches us a broader lesson uh, uh, about uh, the understanding the uh, importance of structural issues uh, for the prospects of, of democracy. And this is not just for Paraguay, but it's for other countries in our region and, and the world. My sense is that a lot of the stuff that happened in Paraguay happened in Caliente. I mean, it was, uh, you know, uh, one was that, uh, I mean, it has to be, if we're going to go into the details of all this here, um, Lugo pissed off a lot of people, including his main allies in the Liberal Party. Uh, uh, for, uh, for, you know, because of just sheer political inexperience, uh, 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 ego tripping, or, or, or a miscalculation. Um, and, uh, and because of bad advice that he had, uh, by the end his closest entourage were mainly Colorado advisors, which also ticked off his, 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 his stalwarts on the left and so forth. Um, so my sense is that uh, it, they speeded things up I'm sure they factored in Honduras, but it wasn't much in the discourse there uh, of the day. They speeded things up because, one, they felt that the Constitution, they interpreted the Constitution as allowing them uh, uh, the right to, you know, to, uh, uh, to use a juicio, not as a tr political trial, but as a political judgment. And that, that, that judgment did not, you know, and sort of they almost interpreted, uh, 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 so to speak, as if it was a parliamentary a vote of no confidence except that Paraguay is not a parliamentary republic, right? It's the presidential system. So, but they made that kind of narrow interpretation and, uh, and, and you know, they, it's a plausible interpretation. I disagree with it. And, and I think it harms the spirit of democracy in Paraguay. But I think they, you know, they, they, were, they were ticked off for many reasons. There was a, a sudden move uh, to impeach and, it's, and it was the 25th out of, the, you know, the 25th time that a serious rumor had emerged about impeachment of Lugo. Lugo had been on a hamstring for much uh, uh, of his years as president. I thought he, had, he was spared towards the end uh, uh, because, uh, you know, because you know, the election was coming up so soon, it's coming up in, uh, in next April. Uh, but I was mistaken and because I didn't consider this, this probably was one of the prime motivations for the Liberal Party uh, to join in the impeachment. One, they got, they were personally, the leaders were personally ticked off at Lugo. Lugo had offended them. The president of the party, Lugo, would not take his phone calls and hadn't been talking with him uh, 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 for the last three months. This is the party that gave Lugo 70% of the vote for his election. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so many of them were really ticked off. Uh, their personal rapport was not good. Uh, and, uh, but then at some point, I'm sure that liberal uh, 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 people, the liberal party, made the following calculus. If we take over the presidency now, for the next coming election, we'll have the reins of the state. A maquinaria do Estado, no? We'll have the reins of the state, and we can use that to further our candidate. And, uh, and they made a very smart move. They picked the best of their candidates. Instead of feuding, as they had been feuding massively in the months before, they picked the best, the brightest, and uh, the most experienced, and the most attractive for independent voters of all their candidates, who's going to be a very serious contender for, for, for the vote now. And they basically said, OK, you're going to be our candidate. Now we've coalesced as a party, right? So one should understand a lot of these issues in terms of a lot of the political intrigues and dynamics. And, uh, and I think that uh, uh, they were thinking a lot less about the consequences uh, uh, for the international community of what were happened. And they were acting much more in caliente because of stuff that was taking place uh, uh, and, and on the local scene, right? 
my sense and the, and, and the argument that I make for why the position of Mercosur that UNASUR was good and is good for Paraguay uh, uh, is because they will think twice, I think, before they rush into some kind of hasty decision of this kind in the future. Because it's a cost, you know? It's an embarrassment. Uh, uh, Paraguay, you know, is, is now viewed as sort of an ostracized state. I'm dealing with the IDB on certain projects. The IDB no longer has a head rep in, in Asuncion. It's a mess to try to deal with any IDB uh, project at this point. And, and the reason IDB is not putting anybody in is, you know, everybody's turning the cold shoulder on Paraguay, right? And the, the, and, and the running joke in, uh, in, in, in Paraguay, there are a lot of jokes about this whole thing, at least they're keeping their sense of humor, is that, uh, that the, the poor president, Federico Franco, and his wife are all ticked off because they have all these fancy dress, dress wear they would love to wear in these international cocktails, and they can't get invited to anything because everybody's giving them the cold shoulder, right? Um, the one thing that I would uh, underscore about uh, Brazil uh, uh, that I found worrisome in the last uh, few weeks, uh, the debate that ensued in Brazil about the, what had happened in Paraguay and whether it was democratic or not, and which also followed up quite intensely in Uruguay uh, 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 as the Blancos and the Colorados started attacking the Frente Amplio for joining the sanctions in Mercosur, is this. Um, you know, I, and, 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 and I was particularly alarmed to see Fernando Enrique Cardoso who you know, we all recognize as a statesman and a man committed to democratic principles, uh, um, making statements, uh, uh, particularly when he was in, uh, in interviews after he received this prestigious Kluge Prize Award uh, in the National Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. A few, a few weeks ago, basically arguing that the Paraguayan impeachment process was legitimate and democratic because it abided by the constitutional law. And uh, my sense, and you've seen Uruguayan, Colorado, and Blanco leaders making similar arguments, and my sense, and my concern is this, I don't think these people are that worried about Paraguay. I think they're more interested in sticking it to Dilma or sticking it to Pepe Mujica than they really are about, about the prospects for democracy and, and Paraguay. And so using Paraguay as a linchpin and, and, and with these kinds of statements is kind of worrisome, particularly because I've followed so closely the massacre of uh, peasants in 19, April 1996 when Cardoso was president. In El Dorado dos Carajas, 19 peasant, uh, uh, peasants were massacred by the, by the police. Uh, a similar situation which triggered the crisis, which triggered Lugo's impeachment, right, in Paraguay. Uh, and nobody in Brazil at that point, not even peop, flaky people on the left, would have thought that an impeachment was, was justified on the president of Brazil. So Cardoso should know better, I think. And, and I'm, I'm quite disappointed with, with this, this kind of attitude. Yeah, that refers to the controversy uh, 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 involving a, a Canadian company, multinational, Rio Tinto. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me just quickly respond now that I've started with this and then move. Um, you know, there's no doubt that that company uh, uh, was, I mean, there was a very sticky negotiation uh, uh, over, I mean, the company has, there's no bauxite in Paraguay. So the company basically wanted to come to Paraguay to use the Itaipu energy. Uh, they would have to pay, pay high costs to transship a lot of the uh, raw materials to be able to process them in Paraguay. But the whole advantage of doing it in Paraguay was because, because Paraguay has all this surplus energy. It's a huge energy export and all this surplus energy that can be used from Itaipu, right? And, uh, uh, and so their interests revolved essentially around getting a good uh, a price for the use of that energy. And uh, a lot of people in the Lugo government, there was a divided opinion in the Lugo government, were saying, you know, if they want to come and do it, let them pay market share prices. Uh, because over the long term, Paraguay is going to start using more and more of its Itaipu energy. And then Paraguay will have to supplement that with alternative sources that are no longer going to be hydroelectric. Uh, uh, and so there was a whole very, uh, 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 there was a thriving open debate on this issue. Um, you know, what happened is that as soon as the coup took place, uh, uh, a lot of favorable decisions, but not finalized decisions, were made that indicating that the government would acquiesce with a special price and subsidy for uh, Rio Tinto Alcan. Um, you know, there was a similar comment about Monsanto uh, and having its, uh, uh, one of its major seeds, uh, genetic uh, modified seeds, uh, authorized in the few days at that after, the, after the gold impeachment. And so, you know, Latin America, we're all, all often, you know, since La Vena Javierta de America Latina from Eduardo Galeano and others, we're always sort of attuned to the possibility that there could be some big, powerful economic actors that uh, are, you know, uh, are, are, are doing conniving things in the backstage. Uh, I mean, the issue is that, as, as with any, any concern, you know, these things have to be proven, right? Uh, you could make conjecturas, conjunctures, but, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a rigorous empiricist. 
And, uh, and I would like to see some great journalist or somebody go out and really dig up uh, what, the, what the actual story is. I don't know, I don't know what the actual truth is. But it's an, in it's a, it's an interesting and worthy thing to investigate, yes. Uh, well, the first thing is that you know, they're traditionally, for a long time, very cordial relations. Uh, uh, you know, the embassy that Paraguay has in Brasilia has historically been one of the most important ambassadorial po posts. The fact that because of vetoes in the Paraguayan Senate, uh, uh, that for the last few years Paraguay has had no ambassador in Brasilia has sort of complicated the, the fluidity of, uh, of the relationship in Brasilia itself, right? Um, so in general terms, relationships are always cordial and uh, 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 I mean there could be serious moments and intense moments in some negotiation. But the general perception of Paraguayans, uh, Paraguayan elites, intellectuals, and so forth, is that uh, uh, they get screwed by Brazil, right? Uh, uh, you know, they won't ever say that in very plain and, and coarse terms to a Brazilian diplomat. But the general perception, whenever you talk to them, is that we get screwed by Brazil, but the Brazilians are very suave, polished, genteel, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, they, they do it well. <laughs> they don't make us feel too bad about the fact that we're being screwed uh, 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 by them. But, but, there, but there's that lingering resentment about that. Uh, uh, and in certain quarters, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they will point out very quickly that things that Itamarati cares for the most and its diplomats work diligently on in Paraguay are to protect the Brasiguayos. And this is not the poor Brasiguayos that barely have a, a, you know, a plot of land to work on. It's the well-to-do Brasiguayos that are you know, in conflict with landless peasants in Paraguay, right? Uh, so there's often the, the sense that the, that the Itamarati is there to protect the uh, uh, Brazilian elite in Paraguay, linked to the agribusiness, uh, and that, the, and that the Brazil is uh, um, utterly uh, uh, um, unwilling to understand and to acknowledge the legitimacy of Paraguay's claims in Itaipu. And there's a recurrent frustration over the fact that uh, you know Brazilian diplomats say that uh, you know there's this Latin word about uh, uh, once you have a pact you can't change the pact, right? Uh, uh, and they say, but we've already altered so many other aspects of the Itaipu Treaty. Why can't we alter some more substantial ones that really matter to us? So there's a, a, a sense of frustration with the, with, with the Brazilians. Uh, it doesn't manifest in day-to-day -day interactions, but any Paraguayan in the back room will often speak in scathing terms about the way they're treated by Brazil. That's a good point, I appreciate it. Um, I do want to preface by saying that I started uh, uh, by uh, praising Brazilians, Brazil's Itamarati, uh, particularly in its stances on ser several regime crises that took place in Paraguay from the 1990s on. And, uh, and I said that this should be valued and commended. And so I wouldn't say that it's an entire case of resentment. What I think I'm trying to do is expose issues that are often not fully uh, uh, explored in the public light and in the public conversation between both countries. I have a great fondness for Brazil. I know the country very well. I have great friends in that, in, in, in that part of the world. And, and uh, very often on, on sport competition, if it's not Brazil-Paraguay, I cheer for Brazil. Uh, uh, so I, I, I can't be said to be someone with resentment towards Brazil. But as I said, I do feel the need to speak truth to power. And, that, and, and Paraguay is the disempowered country, and Brazil, in our relationship, is the power, powerful country. And sometimes somebody has to come up and say these kinds of things. But it's with great respect for a lot of things that Brazil does well, and that I cherish and appreciate about Brazil. Um, that said, uh, this is not a lecture on uh, a talk about the Paraguayan problems in developing democracy. I could have numerous things to say. And, and, and these would be uh, things in which Brazilian issues are very tangentially, uh, if, 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 if at all, involved. Where Paraguayans are basically people that have not, you know, I mean, not Paraguayans, but sectors in Paraguay. Here, the, the, the analysis is no longer about Paraguayans per se, but sectors of the Paraguayan elite or Paraguayan political class or establishment or the economic elite in Paraguay have also had a role in undermining or diminishing prospects for democracy, right? And in some cases, uh, as, I, as I stress, Brazilian issues are very tangential to, to these kinds of problems. Uh, um, so there's much to be said. I always uh, had a, a, a view that I think that, uh, uh, and this is a personal you know, example of thing, something that concerns me, that uh, the Paraguayans could do a lot more to educate their population on the whole question of Itaipu. 
I think that, and I propose this to people in Itaipu, uh, unfortunately my ideas have sort of lingered, but at one point when Paraguay played Brazil for the World Cup eliminations of the last round, I was in Paraguay, and this was just when, the, uh, when Lugo had won the election and the whole issue of renegotiating the treaty uh, or aspects of the treaty with Brazil was up in the air. I actually uh, persuaded the head of the Barra Brava of the Club Olimpia and the head of the Barra Brava of Club Cerro Porteño, the two main football teams in Paraguay. I got on the phone, was able to get contacts, and I persuaded them to, uh, 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 to come up with these big banners calling for justice in Itaipu. And uh, I went to see the match which we won, famously two to nothing, played really well. Uh, uh, and, uh, and both Barra Bravas had, uh, were cheering songs for this, uh, uh, and they had signs. And I think that uh, mobilizing Paraguayan public opinion and stirring uh, people's power in a sense that, that can convey to Brazilians, and, 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 and a not, uh, not in a chauvinistic term, but in a sense of, uh, of you know, democratic national pride, that this is something that is a serious injustice for us and that we can stand up in many corners of our, of our society, including in football matches, and call on Brazilians to re-examine themselves and re-examine the way they're dealing with Paraguay. I think that's legitimate, and I think that Paraguayans could be doing a lot more things uh, uh, of that kind. I've, I've been inclining people to do it, but, uh, but this people power agenda has not fully caught on yet. Uh, maybe it will. Thank you very much, Miguel.